Hey, everybody, and uh, welcome to another episode of Office Hours. I'm your host, Robbie Kelman Baxter. Uh, today, our guest is Jamar Johnson, Jamar John Johnson. Um, and before I introduce him, uh, I want to remind you uh, that we are live and you can feel free to put any questions or comments in the comments area. And you can also um, watch this uh, in the recorded format after we are done, but it's much more fun to be live. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the how to becoming an awesome, authentic networker, um, being non-cheesy, being yourself, and making real connections. My guest, Jamar John Johnson, uh, as he often says, brevity is levity, so I'm going to keep this short. Jamar is known for helping clients find the right niche to communicate their messages, exchange their values, and build better relationships. Um, he's funny, he's engaging and effective, and I know we're going to have a great time and learn a lot about how to truly super connect with others through our awesome, authentic selves. So without further ado, welcome to my favorite entrepreneurian, Jamar. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for having <laughs> me here, Robbie. Oh, it's it's a real thrill to, to have you here. Now, entrepreneurian, it's, it's even hard for me to say, what is that? Entrepreneurian is an entrepreneur that understands that at the core of his or her business, using humor to connect instantly with potential clients and customers is the fastest way to grow your business and your brand with authenticity. And if you can look up entrepreneurian in the Urban Dictionary, and you'll get the, the more brief definition of it. But it's something that I came up with because I've been pursuing stand-up comedy for now 17 going on 18 years. And I've been pursuing entrepreneurship for nearly 30 years. Oh, I love that. And I, I'm definitely adding that word to my own dictionary. Um, so so tell us a little about yourself and maybe um, spend a couple of minutes sharing your journey um, that, that made you a, a super connector and brought you to where you are today. Sure. I'll give you a quick little overview. You know, growing up in the inner city of New York City at 12 years old, I was the oldest of four kids. And, you know, I wanted all the things that I saw my friends have, but my mother really wasn't in a position financially to do so. Uh, she was now divorced twice and widowed. And, you know, there's a lot of financial strain on her. So I took it upon myself at 12 years old to go and find myself a job. The first job I had was packing groceries at the local supermarket called Metz on 104th Street and 3rd Avenue. And what was really unique about that is that the reason why I found out about that job is I saw a bunch of Latin American gentlemen standing in line before the, the doors opened. And I asked them one day, you know, why they were there. And they go, we're waiting for the store to open so that we can go get in line and, and, and grab a lane. And it dawned on me that they were not actually employees of the supermarket. Instead, they were independent contractors who took it upon themselves to provide a service of bagging the groceries. So at 12 years old, I told a few friends that week what my plans were on that Saturday, and none of them joined me, but I went by <laughs> myself, and I found myself with a lane. And that day, I worked for about five hours, and I made about $48.17. And the That's life nice was work for a 12-year-old. Nice work for a 12-year-old. Now, at the time, I believe the minimum wage was something around 4.15, maybe 4.25. I realized that I had made double what the minimum wage was on my own terms. And I, at that point, I was hooked on entrepreneurship. Now, one of the things that made me an effective grocery bagger was that I didn't just pack the bags. First, I asked questions to the patrons. I asked them as their preference on how they'd like paper or plastic. Would they like both? Uh, where would they like to make sure it was on the top of the bag versus the bottom of the bag? And then over time, as I got more comfortable with that, I started injecting humor and, and asking them what they were cooking for dinner and asking them if I could join them and just building relationships until eventually, I'd say after several months of doing that, I had certain people who, when they came shopping on Saturdays and Sundays, they would actually come and choose my line to come down to make sure that I packed <laughs> the groceries. Uh, and then oftentimes I got people who said, hey, could you deliver the food for us You know, as well, which could sometimes garner a 5 or $10 tip. But I was smart. And I said, you know what? Depending on the person, some people tip well, some people don't. So some of these, these deliveries, I'm going to just hand off to someone else who's waiting for a lane. And that way mm. I'm in my lane so that I can work 
and guarantee my income for a certain amount of time before I wanted to check off. And so when I was ready to check off right in that window, when someone said, hey, would you deliver this? I was like, absolutely, because I was ready to go anyway. So now I get an extra big tip on the way out. So at 12, that's what started for me. Now at 14 and 15, I did some messenger work. At 16, I started my own airbrush business. Again, I was the artist, but I had the ability to communicate with people and draw out of them what they wanted, what, what kind of art did they want on their t-shirts or their hats that I was airbrushing. And, I, and so I, I had a real strong affinity for selling, for communicating, for marketing. And then I joined the military on a scholarship and uh, you know the rest is history in terms of I got educated, but when I was 25 years old, I saw the cast of the Dave Chappelle show perform stand up in Boston, Massachusetts on one. Wait, can I just interrupt real quick? Sure. That that military bit to get your education. Sure. That's, a, that's a pretty big chunk yeah. of that, those early yeah. years. And I'm curious if those had any impact on on your, you know, learning about who you were and what your values were or. Um, maybe gave some inklings as to where you were going to go? Or, or do you feel like the military was, you know, a good place to to develop and learn skills in a way of paying for your education, but but not as relevant to what you're doing now? Yeah, the military itself was not as relevant to what I'm doing now. But what it was, was it was a nice stepping stone for me to step into the, a place where I could think a lot. I had a lot of time on my hands. And so when I was in the military, so first I was a Marine, I was enlisted. I applied for a scholarship. I got the scholarship. That took me from active duty to reserve duty. While at college at Auburn University in Alabama, I studied business management with a focus in accounting, a minor in marketing, but marketing and psychology were really the areas that I found most appealing. However, I was trying to be very practical and get a degree in accounting. So I knew I could always have a job as a CPA, for example, right? But when I was 25 years old and I was a naval officer, I was in a leadership role, so I was constantly communicating with people and connecting. But what happened was when I saw the cast of the Dave Chappelle show perform live, it dawned on me that there was something inside of me that called me to really take all of the pain and suffering and turn it into, I like to, I like to say transmute it into positivity or light. And so seeing what those performers did on stage, it was Kyle Grooms, Marina Franklin, Bill Byrd, Donnell Rawlings, and rest in peace, Charlie Murphy, Eddie Murphy's brother, had headlined that show. What happened for me was that I saw that it was both a joy and a pleasure to experience it, but it was also a business. And I connected the two and they were together as one. So that's where Entrepomedian was actually born, December 2005. And then I realized that you could use some of these same tactics and principles in one-on-one -on -one conversations or in group conversations to create stronger bonds that led to doing business quicker and faster because people do business with people that they know, like, and trust. And so if they know you, and especially if your comedy is very on, on a personal tone, you can really build strong relationships and that, that can lead to doing things down the line. And, and we're seeing this now when you look at people like Joe Rogan, who had a $100 million deal with, with, with Spotify. People don't realize this, but before that deal, he was making $30 million a year with endorsements alone from his podcast as it was. So people really connect with people who are honest, earnest, and make them laugh. Yeah, honest, earnest, and 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 make us laugh. And mm -hmm. I love that. Now, now something that that stuck out to me when you were describing yourself, um, you know, from the time you were twelve years old, sounds like you were a, a pretty um, charming, uh, easy connecting person. That 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 being a friend, being a leader, um, looking out for other people's needs, anticipating what people wanted, plus that little business savvy that seems to have been there from a pretty young age. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that. And I don't know if the people that are that are tuned in and there's there's quite a few from from all over the world. It's, it's pretty exciting to see um, Detroit, Toronto, Saudi, uh, you know, Kansas City. Um, I don't know if everybody that's that's on this on this conversation loves networking and loves connecting um, or whether maybe they love it, but they think it's it's really, really hard. So what are your thoughts about like, is this something that you're just born with like Jamar or um, is this something that you can learn or or build like a muscle? So it was definitely not something that I was born with. Uh, actually, when I was younger, I'm, I'm actually even to this day, you can see I've got a thousand books behind me. I'm an introverted person naturally, but I've learned to be extroverted in a, in a way that suits me. 
but I also know for how much time I can do it before I need to pull back and recharge. So what I would say is that sometimes you see people who look extroverted and they've learned to become that way and they, they've learned to make it look easy and seamless when the reality is I actually really prefer to be by myself. Now, when I developed, when I desired to go work at that initial job of packing groceries was one out of necessity. I wanted to go play basketball and do all the other things that my friends were doing on the weekends. But I also knew that I had desires greater than what my mother could provide. And so what happened was the desire outweighed the fear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I moved a lot as a kid into different schools. And so I was always kind of the new kid and a little shy and, and got picked on a lot, got bullied a lot, actually. But what, what happened for me was I realized that when someone was, was making fun of me, if I could make fun of them back, but not in a way that overshadowed them, but just showed them that, A, I had the chops and also I was game, then I, I could befriend them because they would appreciate that I had the willingness to actually spar. And so what I would say is that you are going to make mistakes. You're going to fail but you're going to get better only through the iterations of the failures. And the failures, while they might seem gigantic to you, what you need to be able to do is not take yourself too seriously and look to try to make people laugh as much as you can because they'll appreciate the attempts. They'll appreciate yeah. the attempts, even if, even if it's awkward. I think everyone appreciates when someone is trying to go for a laugh and also doesn't hurt to ever smile. So that's what I would say is that you, this is a learned muscle because human beings love to connect with one another. There's actually something that happens when you make someone laugh, you actually help them release a neural chemical called oxytocin. And that is the super connection chemical that we all possess the ability to have come out of someone involuntarily. I'm just walking away. That's okay. I, I want to share... Not because I want to share this book. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called Humor Seriously. Yes. Uh, Jen Ocker and, and Naomi Bagdonas. Yes, um, it's one of the books people, in my audio book library. Yeah, one, a great book for people. Maybe um, Nat can put that in the, in the comments. Um, but for people who aren't naturally funny, because it, it is hard work and it sounds like you were a real student mm -hmm. of both, both humor and you know, I, I saw a great comment um, from from Carolyn who says, "Amen." Introverts learn to extrovert well. Um, <laughs> so, for people who are who are thinking about how to incorporate comedy and incorporate humor into their everyday life and their interactions at work, that's a great a great resource. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yes. What else? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, what I was going to say is, sure, yes, there are books, but you know what? The, one of the best things you can do sometimes, especially in a networking environment, is pull up to a group, you know, kind of slowly, you know, not try to make a grand entrance, but really listen keenly for connection points for where you have similarities or where you know of someone or something or some service or some product that could be of value to people as well. That's also one of my other strategies, which is the kind of, in the Navy, we had something, I was a a uh, officer on a ship. And so one of the things that we did is we drove ships alongside and we docked alongside oilers and tankers and sometimes along piers. And so pull alongside very slowly and calmly and listen for a good cue to make an interesting comment uh, and take interest in the conversation by listening, not necessarily by speaking. Actually, the more you can ask interested questions, Instead of interesting questions, interesting questions tend to stump people and can and tend to leave them at a loss for words. And it's and mm -hmm. kind of makes you look like the smarter person. Interested questions are are purely sincerely earnest and make people actually think about things that they never really thought about. And they're appreciative as you've had allowed them to go deeper in their own specialty or expertise. And that makes you also super connect as well. Yeah, I, I I love what you're saying there, and a couple of things I want to just pull out for 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 our our group. Um, one of them is it's not important to ask the most interesting question. Not only does it you know is it hard to come up with, but it risks putting your group you know into a into a position of discomfort. Mm -hmm. And it's much better to be genuinely interested, especially in an area where you have a real connection. Um, and you know it's amazing. I don't know if anybody else has had this experience, but. You know, I've definitely been at events where I've stood and listened for the whole time and nodded and agreed and asked questions to learn more and then been told at the end, you are so interesting. 
yeah. <laughs> when I'm like, I didn't say I, anything about myself. <laughs> no, and that's actually what, because what happens is there's a mirroring, right? When you help someone actually uncover and unravel themselves, you're actually a mirror for them. And they're actually taking a, a moment to, to examine things that they maybe haven't done in a while. And so they appreciate that about you. And so it makes you interesting in itself because not many people actually use that approach. And so many people are trying to you know, list off all their accomplishments and humble brag. And when you're really- Beware like, the humble brag. Right. And so what happens is, and, and this was something too, you know, especially in the comedy world, there's a lot of showcases, right? Where there are lots of comedians. What tends to happen, especially the better you get, is that when you get off the stage and you actually meet the audience, the show ends, people are like, man, we, we wanted more of you because you paced yourself, but also you left them wanting more. And yes. so in your networking relationships, don't oversaturate someone with this over the top. I'm, I've got to make you laugh at all costs. That's not yeah. what humor is. Humor and is more insightful. Yeah, I, I've experienced with people sometimes who are nervous while networking that they, it's almost like they want to show you all their goodies, all their mm -hmm. jewels at once, like every funny thing they can think of, everything mm -hmm. about them that, that might connect with you, and they want to give it to you all at once. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's overwhelming, and then it leaves them with nothing, right? They don't have anything left in their, in their toolkit to, to, to bring in later. And it's funny, sometimes if you just relax into the situation, um, focus on being interested, focus on the other person, the, the relationship evolves naturally. Now, I, I want to ask you a question. It's, it's you know, December 2nd today, um, getting into the holiday season, lots of parties, still some conferences happening, um, lots of big group events and networking. Um, what is your advice for those situations? How do you, how do you sort of gear up for that? And how do you make the most of it. Before we, before we went live, you were talking about sort of the difference between uh, quality and quantity mm -hmm. um, in, in the world of, of, of building, building relationships. W what's your advice for people who are, you know, looking at their calendar for the next few weeks and thinking, wow, I have big family events, big work events, big social events, kind of exhausting. How do I, how do I make the most of that? Yeah. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, self-care is important. So holiday seasons, you're running around trying to get gifts. You're running around in extra traffic than normal. Uh, what I would say is for sure, make sure you have some sort of self-care regimen, whether that's walking a few miles every day, a little bit in the morning, in the evening, thinking about intentionally going into this next quarter. You know, what is it that you desire personally, professionally, you know, on a hobby level? Think about those, those activities, right? And then when you're going to these events and you're connecting with people, You've got your group that you're super comfortable and familiar with. What I would ask you to do is venture off a little. I call it the rule of 33%. Spend 33% of your time at these events with people that you know, right? There are going to be people that enter those little groups, but you're comfortable in that area. Then venture off a little bit and spend 33% of the time connecting with people that are maybe a little bit further along in, in, the, in their careers than you are and get some insights on how to move up the chain a little bit. And then look at people who are maybe not as not where you are and go and mm -hmm. give a little bit, give a little bit of a, of a mentorship. If you take that approach when you're networking, you'll have a great time. And then you can obviously round that back up with connecting with people that you really know, like, and trust before you leave. And that way you don't feel like you're exhausting your energy trying to constantly connect with new people. Yeah. So I love that. So the first thing is rule of 33%. So spend about a third of your time with people you don't know as well. So you're not overwhelming yourself. You're taking good care of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about self-care. And then you talked about the different kinds of people that you want to have in your network, which I think is really important and sometimes overlooked. So you, you talked about uh, people who are ahead of you, people who are behind you, people you can mentor, people who can mentor you. Um, other other groups of people that I sometimes think about in, in networking, uh, your peers, that's the 66% probably, the, the people no, no, who are no. like- 33, 33, 33. So you're going to spend 33% of the time with people that you already know, and those are going to be your ah. peers typically. Those okay, are your gotcha. peers. Then 33% of people that you want to ascend to be, and then 33% of people that are your juniors. So mm -hmm, that makes mm -hmm. up about 99%. You can spend 1% okay. with the odd people that no one- As you wish. 
<laughs> but, but, right. but, but you know what? There's insights to be had from all people because the people who are on the outskirts of, of the party, they see things very differently from everyone who's on the inside. And so yeah. sometimes by connecting with those people, you could find out some insights and also like why why do they feel like they're not quite a part of it? What's missing? Yes. And that's, a, you and know, that's something about leadership and empathy and really trying to understand the full picture because that could help you really connect and move up as well. This is a solid gold tip on networking, I think, what you just said, that, that, that there are the people who are on the fringes, who look like they're not having a good time, who don't seem to have anyone to talk to, might be the most valuable, interesting people to talk to mm -hmm. um, of the whole of the whole event, and 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 I think there's there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, as you said, one of them is they have a different perspective, mm -hmm. right? Um, another is it's good it's good karma, it's goodwill. If somebody stand, we've all I don't know if there's anybody on this you know conversation who has never experienced standing alone at a party, you know I'll, I'll bow down to you for your for your connection expertise, but I've certainly had the experience of going somewhere and thinking. You know, I'm I'm a pretty interesting person. Nobody wants to talk to me, and I'm I'm not feeling my best. I'm not on my game, and it's lovely when somebody seems interested in me. And and then I think um, it gives you an advantage because everybody else is talking to the same people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I think if there's one thing that people take away, it's you know when you're networking, when you're out in a group, keep your eyes on the people on the on the outskirts. Um, and, and a quick little thing on like what to say. Sometimes when there are people that aren't, they don't feel like they're a part of it. You know, people always wonder, well, what do you say to someone? And I say an easy, easy uh, formula to remember is called form, family, occupation, recreation, and then motivation, right? And so when you go speak to those people, ask them a little bit about, you know, their family, ask them about what their role is with the company, how do they enjoy it, ask them about their recreations. People love to talk about the things they do for fun. It might be gaming, it might be hiking, it might be working out, but typically they're going to have a level of expertise that's a little bit more, maybe not quite mastery, but they are probably intermediary in the areas that they spend a lot of time as a hobby. And then you might find someone who's got a hobby that they've actually spent a lot of time on that you're thinking about getting into. And so that's also a, a great area for connection. Yeah, I, I love that. I love thinking broadly about the connections. Um, when I was very young and I was just starting out in business um, and I looked at how other people thought about, you know, networking with a capital N, it, you know, it had a, a big stack of business cards and a scanning the room for the most important person. Let's all make a beeline for that person. And then you get to the front and you're like, I have nothing to say to you. That was a great speech. Um, you're very important. Um, I would love for you to help me. I mean, there's nothing really to say. Mm -hmm. um, and it's those other, the planting of seeds with the other people, I think, that is is so valuable. And I know you're about connection, not so much networking. And, you know, there, there's a relationship between the two. But I think when you focus on the connection part, um, you know, the networking is, you. I think of it as utilizing the relationships you have to achieve your goals. Um, but first, you have to have those real connections. Absolutely. So, so think about it. Networking. Think about that word. You have a network, but networking is just the utilization of the network that you have. You don't have a network if you don't have connection. You just have people in a, I'm old school, so Rolodex or in your contact <laughs> list, right? You just have people in a contact list. But if those people have no idea about what you can do for them or who you know that can do things for them, then it's not really a network. It's just a, a bunch of individual people that you have. It's about connecting. And that's where inviting people to things, bringing people together, whether that be yes. online like we're doing here or in, in real life or in the metaverse. Yeah. Finding a way to bring like your, your network, your individual connections together is what makes what we call the network effect. Yes, I love that. And I just want to comment, Emily, uh, the people who stand alone have been the most interested and the kindest. They remember you. And I see Venkata said, you know, well said. I, I totally agree. Um, beautiful, beautiful sentiment. Um, so, Jamar, I want to ask you, um, we, have, we have only a few minutes left. Um, and I want to ask really? you about- Really? Only a few minutes left? It's going by I, too fast. I, Robbie, we're having I so know. much fun. <laughs> I know. I, I'm, I'm like so. So one of the things that makes people uncomfortable. We were talking about this a little bit in the networking and you know sort of how to think about this in a more holistic and organic way. Um, 
so, some people uh, think of networking very transactionally, as you said, the wrong way to think about it. Um, and, and some people are at the other end of the spectrum where they invest all of this time in building real relationships, but then they're afraid to ask for anything. Mm. Can, you, can you say something about what it's like to tap into your network, to um, ask for a favor, to offer sure. um, help? What, what is the right way to think about that? So here's what I would say. When you're, when you're utilizing your network, the very first way that you should utilize your network is to actually build some capital in your network. Now, how do you build mm -hmm. capital? You build capital by reaching out to your network and asking them of the things that you know about them, are there anything that you can help them with with your, with your expertise? The reason why you want to focus on your expertise is because you do not want to overextend yourself trying to build capital with people in your network. Hmm. That comes with time, right? Mm -hmm. So you reach out to them and you ask them if there's anything that they need help with that you specialize in. And maybe it's for fee or maybe it's for volunteer or maybe it's helping out their nonprofit. And actually, that's one of the areas that I really love because a part of my ethos and my core values is to help nonprofits uh, create more sustainable offers that that their audience can't refuse. So it's not like, here you're just giving, giving, giving. Their audience is getting something in return. So mm -hmm. I love to, to, to help people that I know in my network with their nonprofit work. And that's a good way to just put some cachet in those personal bank accounts. And then when you need something, you don't feel any trepidation about asking because you've already shown the willingness to give them without expectation. That's the thing. Yeah. And so sometimes yeah. you might give a whole bunch in this direction, but the value actually comes from a different direction. Don't always expect yes. it to be exactly reciprocal or one-to-one, -one, but I would say first, give a bunch of value first before you ever start to ask. And some of that value might just be information. It might just be consultation, or it might be connecting people in your network together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. And, and I saw you know, there, there's there's comments. Um, Melissa T says, you know, uh, that that's a really good point. Don't overextend yourself when building relationships, which I think is is really important. That you sometimes you want to be so helpful that you're like, sure, I can rewrite your business plan for you, no problem. Why don't I Why don't I do that? And you're like, why did I offer to do that? And there's mm -hmm. so many ways so often to be able to use leverage to use something that's easy for you, but hard for someone else. Yep. It could be your experience. in a lot of times, in a lot of cases, like you've already gone the hard road, you can tell them how to avoid the bumps. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, something that you're naturally inclined to do, like you talked about, you're working with the nonprofits that um, kind of fills your soul and sort of feeds your, your own personal mission. Mm -hmm. um, but there's lots and lots of ways to give first when you meet people. And I think that's, that's really important. And it also makes it easy, easier, I should say, when it's time to ask for help to ask. And, and I think you brought up something that I think is, is so important and can be a real stumbling block for people, which is that sometimes the person that you do the most for, when you ask them for the tiniest favor, they're not able to reciprocate. And then over here in left field, there's somebody else who, you know, maybe you hardly even know mm -hmm. who does something for you that really moves you forward. And so it's not always, you know, tit for tat. It's not like I'm going to help you with this. Therefore, you're going to make an introduction for me. It's I'm going to help you with this because that's what I can do right now. And I'm going to trust that somewhere in this bank of goodwill that I've built up, something else is is going to is going to come back to, to me that there's there's kind of good karma that circulates. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's see, we're at the bottom of the hour, which is theoretically when we're supposed to end. Do you have another minute or two? <laughs> I do. I do. You know what? I could do this all day. I love, you know, just sharing the, the things that I've learned over the years. So this is a blast, Robbie. This yeah. Is oh, oh, good. Well, I, I want to ask, since we're on LinkedIn and you and I are both LinkedIn instructors and I encourage people to check out our courses. Um, I provided links in the, um, in the description of this session for free access to both Jamar's class and my class, if, if you'd like to uh, learn more about networking and connection. Um, but I'm, I'm interested, you know, we both spend a lot of time on the LinkedIn platform. What advice do you have for people about how to build authentic connection through LinkedIn? Is it possible or? Oh, it's 1000% um, it's possible. I've had some incredible relationships, uh, friendships, business partners, uh, all sorts of connections through LinkedIn. 
And what people don't realize too is this is this is the time for LinkedIn. And what I mean by that is we're going through a whole big transition in our entire economy in the U.S. especially. Uh, a lot more of a work, uh, remote opportunities. Uh, what I would say is that when you're scrolling through LinkedIn, you know, <laughs> people people like to like photos and give little Wait, I just to I photos. just have to interrupt for one yeah. thing. Mike McBride is a good friend of mine and a, and a colleague said, I, I hope Jamar is ready to get LinkedIn connected. Oh, I'm ready, everybody's baby. gonna wanna um, <laughs> gonna wanna connect with you um, after this, please, this amazing please conversation. Do. And so one of the ways that you, and just like that, in real time, oftentimes there's an opportunity to connect with someone. What I would say is be specific about what inspired the connection. Oftentimes people use these basic connections requests and it doesn't inspire someone to really want to connect because it just is generic. What I would say is be specific. Now, what I would say is when you're looking at, especially posts that go viral on LinkedIn, what people don't realize is right now, LinkedIn is having as much algorithm, algorithmic exposure as Facebook did in 2012. Now think about that. Yeah. That means organically, you can connect, connect with a lot of people just by doing the normal things, not doing anything special, posting consistently, commenting consistently, not just liking photos. If you go and leave thoughtful comments, you know, I actually watched someone. I was, I forget where I was. I was waiting somewhere and I saw someone on their phone and they literally had spent about three or four minutes just reading the comments on a post on social media. So people really read what other people are saying mm -hmm. and they're building connections and alliances based on where you stand. Yeah. Now, what I would say is try to avoid being middle of the road. Try to be your authentic self without being offensive to anybody, right? Mm -hmm. But try to be your authentic self and you're going to build and find your tribe on LinkedIn especially. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's important. Um, posting is it can be hard for people to like, you know, think through your own posts, but you know, it, it's it's a great way to to build awareness and, and engagement about what you're interested in and you can be authentic. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to say, you know, when you're making a comment, I think starting with, it's been my experience that, or I have observed that because then it's your experience. No one can argue with what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. um, and it also gives you an opening to be your direct authentic self. Um, I also think when you're posting, I encourage people to post. I think you're right. Like this is the place to be. The time is now on LinkedIn. When you post, one one great way to post is to look at what's happening in the news that day and say, do I have an opinion about any of it? That's just an easy hook to get you going. Um, and the other thing, I, I have a, a good friend, Bob Baxley, um, who's a really well well regarded um, designer. Um, he he works at Apple. He designs the Apple stores and Apple experiences. He worked there. Um, now he's uh, he's somewhere else, but he he's really a, a phenomenal. Uh, thinker. And what he told me he does on LinkedIn is every day he posts his own little journal. This is what I'm thinking about today. This is what I learned today. I learned today that it's better, you know, to listen than to speak. I learned today that, you know, something that's obvious to me at my stage is really new for, for other people. And he posts it and it takes him two seconds, right? It's just a sentence or two, but mm -hmm. people are following along on the journey. He's a, you know, he leads a big team. He's a very senior guy, but you know, he's being really authentic. And I think that's a great way to wade into the waters that is LinkedIn. I agree. That's the, that's the Twitter approach, <laughs> but, but doing it, doing it now on LinkedIn is it's great because the algorithm is wide open okay. and they really want to encourage the platform's use and connection and so it's the, it's the place to be for business in 2023 and beyond. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm not sure we should take Mike McBrien's advice. Um, politics and religion, great things to bring up on LinkedIn. They, um, they actually yeah. are, but if you have <laughs> a nuanced approach to them, yeah. it's, it's going to evoke emotion with people. But nuance is key. Not simply uh, yeah. putting your flag in, a, in the sand, but being nuanced with it because ultimately – if you are a uniter of people, that means you have the ability to attract people from all sides. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I agree with you. I, I do think that you know, if you're just wading into the the LinkedIn waters, you may not want to start with uh, with politics and religion. But I agree that if if you can 
sort of thread the needle of integrity, respect, and uh, authenticity, um, you can get an amazing conversation going and um, and build some some genuine genuine relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm. Um, uh, I want to just close out this nice comment from Elena. I would like to acknowledge the authenticity and warmth of this dialogue. Excellent nuggets. Thank you. Um, oh, Mike McBride says joking. Um, <laughs> and uh, and this one I'll, I'll leave you with, which is uh, Jamar is a super connector. Uh, I think no more needs to be said. Um, That's my guy, Jeff Dolan. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, this was this was so much fun. Um, thank you so much for for making time um, to to talk to us on uh, on office hours. Um, and I hope I hope it's the first of many conversations like this. I think so. Uh, I think I kind of like you, Robbie. You're you're pretty. Awesome. <laughs> You got some insights over there. <laughs> I like you too. I'm I'm really enjoying this, and I'm I'm looking forward to to talking more. And maybe we'll we'll cross paths in Carpinteria, uh, and do some some recording at a, at a future date. But um, okay. we've already gone over time, so I want to thank you so much. We're back on uh, December sixteenth with uh, at ten a.m. with our uh, our next guest. So join us then. And in the meantime, uh, thanks for seeing you, and hope to see you around LinkedIn. Peace, love, and prosperity, everybody. <laughs>